Welcome everyone to the IAPP Web Conference Digital Advertising Privacy Program Priorities and Tech Must Knows for 2023, sponsored today by Catch. My name is Selena, a programming and speaker coordinator here at the IAPP, and I'll be your host for today's program. We'll be getting started with the presentation in just a minute, but before we do a few program details, participating in today's web conference will automatically provide IAPP certified privacy professionals who are the named registrants with one CPE credit. I also want to let you know that a recording of this program and a copy of the slides will be available in your My IAPP profile under My Purchases, My Recordings portal within 48 hours. Please feel free to post any questions you have for the panelists in the Q&A area at the bottom of the screen. And we are looking forward to this conversation. And with that, I will now hand it over to our panelists to begin today's program. Hey, Selena, thanks. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, we're, I'm Jonathan Joseph. I, I head up Solutions and Marketing at Catch. Uh, what we'll cover today is you know, some of the obligations and in a practical manner what you need to know uh, when it comes to US state regulations as it pertains to digital advertising. We'll cover the IAB state compliance frameworks uh, in the global privacy platform and we'll talk about how these developments are affecting marketing tech stacks and strategy and how, how marketers and brands are responding. Uh, honored to be joined by Tony and Elisa here as we discuss these important topics. Uh, over to you Tony uh, for a small intro. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me today. Uh, Tony Ficarota, I'm IAB's Assistant General Counsel. Hey there, I'm Elisa Hetnick. I chair Kelly Dry's Privacy Practice in Washington, D.C. Awesome. Thanks, both of you, for joining. Well, let's get into it, Elisa. What's, what do we need to know for 2023? In a nutshell, right? Um, so I made a promise that we are going to make this as practical as possible. And so we're not covering the waterfront, but we're focusing on a few of the hot button questions that we are hearing a lot. And so right up at the top, when do I need to comply? There is a lot of focus on January versus July. So we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into what are the kinds of restrictions with service providers, we are familiar with some with CCPA. Now we've got new ones, how to think about that, particularly in the ad tech context. And then I wanna surface notice that collection because I think that that is one of the almost sleeper issues but ends up being really, really important when we think about permissions and kind of what is uh, appropriately collected data subject to the right permissions. And then we're gonna talk about the, the new global privacy control and what does that look like under the new regulations and looking ahead and touch on some flow down obligations and, and then just where to, you know, as we think about each quarter, what are the what are the items to really prioritize in those quarters? So we've got some suggestions on that front. But let's start with when. Uh, everything is not by January. So you have discretion on a whole lot of things by January. And so I think just a heads up, the marketplace is gonna be pretty varied. But I put up this language from CPRA because it's really critical, right? The language in blue, anything that essentially CPRA is amending in CCPA, that is enforceable July 1st and onward. So it can't go back to practices that happened before July. Now, CCPA continues to be applicable until then, and, and then any provisions that were not amended by the CPRA are effective Jan 1. So you will see a lot of companies are starting to roll out the variety of rights because Virginia is the only other state that is effective January. And so, for example, opt out of targeted ads, you can have out that, opt out of sale and share, um, and that might be some, some of the rights that companies choose to roll out as of January, where some of the, the stickier new ones uh, using discretion on whether to, to roll those out as we get closer to July. I will say that just raises the question of what are you gonna update in your privacy policy? Is it a light update just to account for those new things you're rolling out or is it a more in-depth one? I will say either way, you're probably going to be in the position of updating your privacy policy before July, given Colorado uh, regulations and what we find with the finalized California regulations. So just a, a heads up on that front. And then as we think about later in uh, the year, we've got the other state laws that also come into effect and are enforceable. So July being a very, very big date, and then Utah rounding the year out by the end of December. So that's the win. 
Now, what, what are we thinking about? We've got the draft California uh, CPRA regulations, and um, those might have noticed that in the CPPA's agenda, they tend to post the package that they're gonna be talking about at the meeting. And so they did not have the final package of the CPRA regulations. So those of us who are reading tea leaves and forecasting, maybe that's a January thing. So we start seeing those finalized regulations in Q1, January, February. Uh, again, they're not enforceable till July, but we've, we've heard from the CPPA, there's a, a phase two. And so really thinking about what are those additional issues we're gonna see in, in a phase two set of draft regulations out for comment uh, so, so try to keep your head uh, not spinning, and I would just, you know, eye on the prize in the sense of really focusing on what you need to have in the first tier. Keep an eye out for some of the new stuff that's coming in the later regulations, but I would not kind of drop everything to try to incorporate those uh, moving targets. So that's a that's a practical pointer. We don't have much detail on the annual cybersecurity audits or the risk assessments. What I would point out there is we've got some pretty good details in Virginia and Colorado's law that you can certainly use as a version one template. And all of this is, is open to be refined and made better, but don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good and having a good reasonable process focusing on what are the things that are the low hanging fruit that warrant a risk assessment. And so certainly digital advertising, that's our theme for today. Uh, that has been a big driver for these laws. And so really thinking about how is your risk assessment incorporating your universe of digital advertising practices, how you've classified them, do your controls work? And we'll get into that with some examples, but um, I, would, I would certainly have that part of my first uh, phase of efforts for, for any kind of risk assessment. Um, don't get too comfortable, I think, with a lot of these regulations because there are there's going to be shifting sands in the sense that I think it's possible we have even in this finalized package of regulations that their CPPA may change them again. And so, you know, being nimble, I think is being nimble and an open mind to be able to, to tweak programs is going to be really important as we move into next year and the year after that with potentially other states uh, introducing their own privacy laws and seeing do they harmonize, do they not. Um, we saw with the election, there are a few states that got a, a super majority um, on the Democrat side. And so I think that that certainly poses the likelihood that we will see more states with, with privacy legislation. So, so we are watching that. Um, the final thing, if you go to Colorado Attorney General's website, you can register for their um, rulemaking hearing. And I think that's also just a really helpful resource to hear how the office is talking about some of these upcoming priorities. Service provider, who is a service provider? I will just say at the outset, just having a contract with a partner does not make them a service provider. We saw with the difference from the CCPA with the draft regulations that there is a reinforcement, the substance matters. You really need to know what the partner is doing to be able to accurately classify them as a service provider or are they a third party? Are they on the other side of a sale or share? Um, that is really important. Uh, different companies do this in different ways. Some will presume in the digital advertising context, they are a, a, a sale or share depending on what it is unless proven otherwise. By definition with the CPRA, we can't have a service provider who is doing the cross context behavioral advertising, right? So that gets into the factual question of how close are they to activating audiences, to actually doing the, the digital advertising practices. Those are gonna go in the, the share bucket. Um, those who really should be a service provider, right? They are providing services that you can fit within the regulation restrictions on, and the statutory restrictions on what a service provider can do under those business purposes. That's gonna be really important and making sure that you, um, some of these partners may have variety of services. And so maybe some of those services are service provider blessed and some are not. And so it really does matter how you can group that efficiently. Um, we put in a few examples here of the types of practices that are probably not going to fall into a service provider bucket. So interest-based targeting, obviously, um, retargeting, segment creation versus 
some of the typical business purpose exceptions that we are seeing. And of course, short-term transient use, um, that's gonna be really important. And what are the types of ad services um, that are not involving CCDA? And that means really pulling the threads with the business teams to find out exactly what is happening so that you can shore that up mentioned risk assessment before, that's all part of that memorialized package that you are going to have for your compliance program. We are certainly going to get into measurement and frequency capping, but I'm going to, I'm going to hold, uh, hold that for the moment because I know Tony's going to dig into that with the MSPA and the, the GPP. So the sleeper issue I mentioned, notice that collection. This is critical because in the draft regulations, there was a lot of focus on purpose limitations, right? If, if you can use data um, on within the scope of what you've disclosed, but how you disclose that beyond the privacy policy gets a, a big spotlight in these draft regulations. Uh, and if you do it right, and there's a, a variety of requirements set out in those draft regulations, then it's opt out. If you don't have that in the right way in your notice at collection, then there's a presumption it, the, the data practices may be opt-in. So this is another area where I think the marketplace is going to be pretty mixed. I think we'll see CCPA versions of notice at collections for quite some time, but heading up into July, particularly when we talk about our digital advertising practices, you know, I I anticipate it's a it's a pretty detailed chart that's in a link notice that collection that may be the footer of, of websites. Um, hopefully, we might harmonize around an industry standard notice that collection at least for the digital advertising practices. But that would be something to watch, um, and certainly it's part of your your action items that may be a a Q1. I'm thinking about it in a Q2, uh, trying to to build out what that notice looks like. On the, the positive side, there was language in one of the earlier drafts of the regulation that talked about third parties that control, really reinforcing that uh, those on the receiving end of digital advertising are not necessarily your service providers. Uh, there was an earlier requirement, you might need to name them um, or clearly describe what their practice is. So that naming requirement dropped out, but there's still the obligation, as there always is, in your privacy notice to accurately describe what you're doing, which means factually, you really have to understand what the business is doing to make sure that that is captured effectively, both in the notice at collection and as well in, in the privacy policy if those are separate. So again, what are these going to look like? Honestly, I see this as a, as a detailed chart that is plain language. That's the challenge, right? That is visually uh, something that an eighth grade education can read and, and understand. So plain language is gonna be critical. We, we saw that emphasized in the draft regulations. Cookie banners, uh, and I say cookie banners in lowercase because this is not about the accept all or the, the four ca the different categories, GDPR-esque of cookies, but seeing those as a way to surface a link, uh, notice that collection link if you're not gonna put it the footer. So I think we will, we will be monitoring for that we're going to see contracts really requiring certain disclosures. I anticipate that's something to, to keep an eye out for. And then, as I mentioned before, really, I'm, I'm a cheerleader for the idea of, of an industry standard notice at collection when it comes to digital advertising practices. And we'll see where we get with that. GPC, uh, with the Sephora decision, obviously got a lot of attention. We know that it's a priority by the California Attorney General in terms of enforcing the CCPA. Uh, but what do we need to do for the draft regulations, this transition from CCPA, global privacy control, into July with the CPRA, global privacy control? I will note Colorado, yes, they have an, a, a requirement here, but that's not effective until a year later. So I highlight in purple in the draft, the latest version of the draft regulation, we know we need to honor it for browser or device, that's not new, but this second bullet in terms of, you also need to honor it for a consumer profile associated with that browser or device, including pseudonymous profiles. And so when I mentioned earlier, really understanding what your digital advertising practices are and how you as a brand with your partners do profiling, that also pulls into it, how do we honor GPC 
with some persistence if we can do that. Um, and, I, and I emphasize, uh, sometimes we hear from the business teams that it's not possible. And so there are certainly challenges, but if you are doing it for a marketing purpose, it opens up the possibility you can also do it for a compliance purpose. And this is something where certainly the CMPs like Catch are, are offering some solutions here, but I, I think we're gonna see an evolution um, in the marketplace about what, what's available. The, the third bullet is if you are doing identity resolution, uh, they have logged in, you know who they are, then you've got the obligation to really apply it across, across your environment for that particular consumer. So we've heard some heartburn about, does the second bullet really suggest you have an affirmative requirement to do cross-device compliance identity resolution if that's not something that you are already doing for, for marketing reasons? And I just want to point folks to, there's a provision in the CPRA statute that says it, the, the whole CPRA, right, which is inclusive of the regulations, should not be interpreted to require businesses to retain personal information that you wouldn't ordinarily do in the normal course or re-identifying information. And so that's where that, that risk assessment of what you're doing and, and pulling those threads on the actual practices are gonna be important to know you don't need to take this other step because if in the ordinary course of your business, um, that's not occurring. That I think is a moving target. And so it's one of those that you'd have a control, I think to check in uh, with the team to see if things have changed you know, by quarter. Uh, midway through the year, uh, it's, it's a pretty fluid environment. And so given that this is one of the low hanging fruit issues when it comes to risk and enforcement, I would have a very uh, close eye on, on how the company is really responding to this obligation. But again, you've got the CCPA version, which I think is largely good faith, having something that works, even if it's not perfect. And then July being the where we have the more robust CPRA version of GPC. I'm just highlighting flow down requirements. The, the main question that we're hearing is, do we need to retroactively apply uh, opt-outs down to, to, to companies that we've previously sold? And there, there's language in the draft regulations, again, a July thing that really is talking about that intermittent period. So somebody's opted out, you continue to sell for a period of time before you can honor the opt-out. That's where the regulations say you got to go back to the companies you sold to to, to make sure that they're um, acknowledging that opt-out as well. Uh, limitations and flow down regarding sensitive personal information. We're cert even though it's a July thing, we're starting to see that in the contracts, right? And the due diligence upstream. So I think having some sense of if you have sensitive personal information subject to the opt-in or opt-out rights of the state laws, really knowing uh, what that is and, and who your suppliers, how many suppliers, what those contract terms look like. So you can start rolling out some updates um, of those uh, that are responsive to the regulations because you can't just suddenly do those all as of July updating those agreements. So we've got challenges certainly, right? If you have flow down obligations and there's different um, identifiers that don't quite sync up without help from another party, how do you do that? And yeah, that's a good question. I think we don't necessarily need to know the answers for that today. And, and so and flagging where are the practical challenges that we're gonna have to figure out between Q1 and Q2, and those are discussions that are happening in the marketplace. And I think we've got those short list of questions, we should keep them coming and have these types of dialogues. So more to come on that. Um, again, previewing Tony's topic because MSPA and IB Tech Lab's global privacy platform, it's a huge way to at scale, I think, help with some of these flow down requirements in the digital advertising space. So that's something that is worth the time to getting to know, see how that can help be an efficient way, both on the contracts as well as the, the compliance part of that. And then not to go um, granular detail, but here is a suggestion of, you know, when you have so many things to do, it can be a deer in the headlights and just freeze efforts or feel overwhelming. And I, again, this is all about tiering priorities, bite-sized pieces. And so knowing, what are you going to do for the rest of this month that's a must-have 
versus where are efforts going to start, you know, in, in January and really evolve over the first half of the year, and then what happens on the latter half of the year. And so where we're seeing companies focus is, are they doing a light update to the privacy policy or a more rigorous update, rolling out some of the new requirements? That's something to keep in mind. The contract terms where you can have updated contract terms, why not start rolling those out? Uh, emphasize digital advertising compliance, having opt-outs that actually really work and knowing that it's not just cookies. It's obviously beyond cookies for most companies. And so really understanding what your practices are and, and what the business is thinking about doing that's not today, but maybe over the next few months and that's relevant to your privacy notice. Um, figuring out if you're not rolling out all the rights today in, in the way that you update your privacy policy, then thinking about when you're gonna roll those out. And we've got some examples here of other areas to focus on. Um, again, prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony to talk about the MSPA. Yeah, thanks very much, Elisa. And you know what I'd like to do here is again, kind of stick with that practical theme that, that Elisa set up and, and what you need to be thinking about into 2023 and keep it focused on digital advertising. And digital advertising sometimes feels like an esoteric space, but if your company generates revenue from selling digital ads, if you wanna reach an audience with your products or services through digital ads, or if you're a tech company that is somehow in between those two ends of the ecosystem, you've got a lot of new things to think about in 2023 and you need solutions for them. And that's kind of what the IAB has been focused on for the last year is how do we generate solutions for these new uh, compliance issues? Um, and I wanna start by talking about the MSPA, which Elisa referred to. Uh, it's the Multi-State Privacy Agreement. Um, the MSPA is an industry contractual framework that's intended to help everyone in the ecosystem. So again, whether you're generating revenue from the sale of ads, whether you're um, buying digital ads, or whether you're a technology company, um, we want this framework to help everyone comply with the new privacy requirements. And as an industry contractual framework, it's not a model contract or a template agreement. So you may be familiar with the IAB standard T's and C's for ad sales. That's a really important um, model or template, but it's actually designed to be used with one-off counterparties that are negotiating a deal. But the MSPA is different. It's actually a central contract that is intended for all signatories in the ecosystem to be able to sign together and to create a network of signatories that are all in contractual privity with one another. And for companies that are part of this framework, the MSPA provides a set of privacy protective terms that spring into place among the network of signatories and that follow the data as it goes through the supply chain. So basically, if you are sending information for the purpose of selling an ad, buying an ad, or helping to process that transaction, those terms actually follow the data along every node of that network as it makes the jump. Now, if you aren't activated on that node, you're not the one selling the ad, you're not the one buying the ad, the terms aren't going to apply to you for that transaction. But when the data touches one of those nodes, the, the contract terms spring into place and provide those legally required terms to allow for a compliant digital ads transaction. And the way it does that is not just with a contractual framework, but with a signaling framework. Because again, we're talking about a, a network effect of a lot of different signatories that need to be able to communicate with each other about whether a user has opted out of targeted advertising, whether they've opted out of sales, whether a user has been provided with legally required notices like the notice of collection. All that information needs to get communicated through that network of signatories so they know when they have to um, adhere to those privacy protective terms. And that's accomplished through a technical specification called the Global Privacy Platform that the IB Tech Lab has spent the last year developing. Um, the I, so the MSPA also is designed to work with your existing agreements. It supplements existing contracts you might have with your technology vendors or if, if, or if you're doing direct sales for ads, um, it can supplement them with the legally required terms, which can help with scaling the big task of updating all of your contracts to meet all of the specific requirements across state laws. Um, but also if you don't have a contract in place, and unfortunately this can be fairly typical in digital advertising today when we're familiar with, with data taking a lot of hops. Like if you're sending a request to fill ad space on your digital property, like you're, uh, if you're a news site, for example, or a mobile app that, that makes money on ads that way, you might actually have a number of different companies 
down the supply chain that are going to help process that transaction. And it can sometimes be difficult to know for sure whether you have a contract in place or, or whether there are appropriate contractual chains in place for every hop that that data might take to fulfill the transaction. And if there's a gap, the MSPA is also designed to fill that gap and provide legally required terms um, for participants in the transaction. So that's what the MSPA is. And I want to talk a bit more about the specific problems that we see in digital advertising that the MSPA is intended to solve. And the first one um, is kind of the most straightforward one, which is that we, we now have a patchwork of different state laws. Um, the IAB put together a CCPA compliance framework in 2020 um, that was designed to deal with one state law. But that law is changing quite a lot, and there's going to be new enforcement obligations coming into effect no later than July 1st. We also have four new states that are going to impose requirements for opt-outs and, and notices and the like. And so we have a lot more complexity to deal with in the ecosystem. And so to help facilitate compliance with those new requirements, the IAB has done a lot of the legwork here by trying to understand what those requirements are and how they apply to digital ads transactions and provide those specific privacy protective terms for signatories according to each state. However, we're also aware that a lot of companies are thinking about taking a more harmonized approach and providing the same privacy choices or pri and, and privacy notices to all of their users. And in recognition of that, we've also offered as an option for MSPA signatories, the ability to take what we call the US national approach, which is a highest common denominator approach. And this is completely up to um, first parties to the transaction. So if you're a publisher or an advertiser, and you're um, originating a transaction that you want to be covered by this agreement, you can elect to say, well, either I know this person's a California user, say, and I want to use a California specific approach for them and give them California disclosures and California rights. Great, you can do that. And the MSPA has specific terms for that kind of transaction. But if you're saying instead, well, I know that this is a user of um, that's a resident of Colorado, but I don't want to provide them different privacy rights and privacy disclosures than I would provide to a California user or I would provide to a Virginia user. In that case, you can those first parties can choose to say, this user we're going to treat to the highest common denominator standard and give them all of the required notices and choices that are sufficient to comply with any state laws requirements. So if companies want to take a more streamlined approach, they have the option to do that under the MSPA. If they instead want to take a state-specific approach, they have the option to do that as well. And the framework is flexible enough to accommodate both, um, both approaches. And if you think about you know, what some of the costs and benefits are that companies are thinking about when they're making that choice, it's really a lot of the times around efficiency, um, like you know, how, how many how complicated is it going to be from a compliance perspective to do five different states, or maybe next year it's going to be eight different states or however many different states, versus how much am I going to lose if I have more users opt out to a higher standard? And kind of a really practical example of that is the fact that um, service providers under the California law are not going to be able to offer cross-context behavioral advertising as a service. And that's something Elisa pointed to earlier. Um, that's not spelled out in the other laws. So you could say, you know, I have a processor that's acting on my behalf and I can use that data processor to help me deliver a personalized ad. Um, that wouldn't be allowed under California law. It would be allowed under other states' laws. So maybe you have some ad revenue that's at stake based on how you want to answer that question. Do I treat all my users the same or do I treat them according to each state-specific law requirements? Again, the, the framework's intended to be flexible enough to accommodate both approaches. It's up to companies um, to decide which one they wanna take. So that flexibility is key um, uh, for, from our perspective. The second problem I wanna speak to is the broad scope of the term sales that's been indicated by the California regulators. Now, historically in, in digital ads, um, there have been opt-out choices for what we call personalized advertising, targeted advertising. These are common terms that are used. And those opt-out choices have been available um, for a long time. You could go to you know, industry opt-out pages and say, opt me out of targeted advertising. But California introduced this new term called sale. What does it mean to sell personal information? And when are you selling personal information for purposes of digital advertising? 
there's been a lot of debate about that over the last few years. But I think where, we, where, where we're ending up is the California regulator has said, whatever the logic of those debates is, the way we're enforcing the law is that if you are making personal information available to a vendor for a digital ads transaction, and you don't have a statutory service provider relationship in place with that vendor, it's going to be considered a sale by the regulator. There's been a strong signal that that's how they're enforcing the law. That's what we saw in the Sephora enforcement de decision this year. And so that means from our perspective that there are a lot of use cases that we haven't traditionally seen opt-out choices for. Remember, targeted advertising is what we're used to providing an opt-out of. But what if you share personal information to measure an ad? You know, who saw the ads or what devices were exposed to the ads? And then did they buy something later? Uh, or frequency capping. How many times has an ad been shown to this particular end user or device? Usually we haven't thought of those as activities that require an opt-out choice um, because they're not using a profile to select a specific ad for a specific user. But nonetheless, if the data flow that is involved with your vendors for that means giving them an IP address to count how many times that IP address has been served with an ad, that's still at high risk of being considered a sale under the current regulatory environment. And so in order to allow those more basic advertising activities to continue after a user has opted out, in our view, a service provider relationship is the safest way to allow those activities to continue. So that when you share that information with a vendor to just limit how many times one ad is shown to a specific user, the vendor is promising not to do anything else with that information that you give them. They'll count the ads. They won't add that user to a profile. They won't do anything else that is outside of the terms of the service provider agreement. And so that is an important aspect of how this compliance framework can, can work to support more basic digital advertising activities. If a user opts out of sales, or if you're a company that has decided you're not going to sell personal information. In both cases, it's important to have that whole chain of service provider relationships in place throughout the supply chain. And that's what the MSPA is designed to do. Uh, moving on, we also have a new restriction in the CPRA around how service providers can combine personal information. So they've added language saying that if you're acting as a service provider for a company, you are limited in how you can combine information you receive from the business you're servicing with information you've collected from a different business that you're servicing or for, from information you've collected with your own first party interaction with a user. And that implicates some pretty common digital ads activities. And I'll refer back to the other ones I just spoke to about um, ad measurement and frequency capping. If you want to measure how effective an ad campaign has been, that generally involves looking at two different data sets. Where that ad has been shown, so that could be you know, five different publisher sites where an ad has been shown, and then another data set that the advertiser has, which is, are they my customer? Did they buy something? Did they visit my site? And comparing those two data sets and looking at them together to understand, well, was the ad spend worth it? Did we get any results that we care about from showing the ad in all those different places? In some cases, in some measurement methodologies, that involves putting those two data sets together and analyzing them together in a way that calls into question, like, why well, are we combining this data? Same thing for frequency capping. You're showing an ad across one site, two sites, three sites, four sites. If you have four different sites, four different businesses, and you want to count those impressions together, that implicates this idea of combining data. So that's an important new limitation in the CPRA. And what the MSPA does and is kind of uniquely positioned to do because it collects this network of signatories together is allows them, the signatories to that agreement to jointly designate a service provider to carry out those activities on their joint behalf. And this has to do with the fact that under the CPRA, there is language around joint controllership that's very similar to what we see in GDPR. And it's established under um, guidance from the European Data Protection Board under GDPR that people that are exercising joint control over data can also appoint joint processors to assist them with that processing. And we view things like frequency capping and measurement, which are, again, just basic support activities for digital ads, to kind of fall under that rubric where you can engage in joint control over the data flows needed to carry those out. So an advertiser and a publisher that join this framework together can say, 
just for purposes of measurement, when we have to look at those two data sets together, or just for purposes of frequency capping, we want to count how many times the ad is shown. When we're doing that, we're going to assert limited joint control over the data and use the MSPA as a framework to appoint joint service providers to carry that out on our behalf. And we believe that provides a lawful pathway to do those activities in light of these restrictions on combinations. Next challenge, um, there are new contracting requirements in state law. Now, some of these new contracting requirements are just a matter of volume. If you have a lot of different partners, a lot of different vendors, you have a lot of different contracts to update. We see efficiency gains to joining the MSPA framework because you have all those updates made with all the other signatories that have joined. So you can kill a lot of birds with one stone if you join because you then get those updates with all other signatories that have joined. And then the second issue is not just about efficiency, it's also about structure. The, Calif the updates to the California law include a new requirement that says, if you are selling or sharing personal data to a third party, and again, we've just heard how broadly the California regulator thinks sales is, is interpreted, then you have to have a contract with that third party with legally required terms. And further in the regulations, it says that if you are a third party receiving that data, then you're not supposed to process it any further unless you have that contract with the legally required terms. And again, because we're dealing with an ecosystem where data can take hops from one step to the next to get all the way from the publisher that wants to show the ad to the advertiser that wants to deliver the ad, there are sometimes gaps in that chain where to comply with the law, you have to get into contractual privity with those other entities. But it's not always clear how to do that because there are so many hops. What the MSPA does, again, is provide a transparent central framework where everyone can join and then know that they're in contractual privity with every other entity that has joined the framework and fill those gaps to make sure that they're not selling or sharing information to someone they don't have a contract with, or if you're collecting information and you don't know exactly where it originated from, then you you're supposed to stop processing it if you don't have a contract. So in order to deal with that, having that transparent central framework, uh, which we're going to, which we have a, a, we're going to have a list of everyone that signed. So you know, who's joined the framework and who hasn't, that will allow you to understand, is my data going to a party that I have a contract with and have they signed the contract? Okay, so I wanna say just a few words about the signaling framework. Um, a lot of this works because we're able to have a standard way to signal um, whether a transaction is covered by this framework, um, what notices a user has been shown and what choices they've made. Everyone in the framework is gonna to agree to recognize the signals and honor the signals in the same way. Uh, so what are the signals? They're based on the IEB Tech Labs global privacy platform. Um, and well, I, I basically just said all this already. So, so that, that's what it does. And now I'm gonna go ahead and show you a little bit about how it works. So it's an adaptable channel agnostic protocol for signaling user privacy and consent choices through the ad supply chain. And it is channel agnostic. That means it's, it's designed to work with whatever channel or whatever media you need it to work in. So if you operate on the web, the protocol works on the web. If you have a mobile app, it works in mobile. If you have a CTV app or want to do a CTV advertising, it works in CTV. It supports all the state-specific privacy signals that we need to achieve state-level compliance, but it also supports existing signaling frameworks like the EU's TCF, uh, the new Canada TCF, as well as the existing US privacy framework. And it was designed to support all of these, but, but also be future-proof. So if we do get new state laws next year, um, we can add sections to this GPP framework that will accommodate these new, these new state laws without reinventing the wheel and creating a new privacy spec. The IAB is also looking at other jurisdictions where there's privacy compliance needs. So if you're looking at Brazil as an important market, or if you're looking at markets in Southeast Asia that are important markets that have privacy laws, um, the GPP has the ability to accommodate signaling frameworks for those jurisdictions, and that's something we're going to be looking at going forward. And just to give you a quick illustration of, of how it works, um, here, just imagine that you are a user visiting a publisher site and 
the publisher needs to signal downstream what this user's choices are to determine, you know, can I serve them a personalized ad or just a contextual ad? Am I allowed to measure the ad? Can I frequency cap the ad? All of those signals need to go downstream. And so there's a specific uh, API that the IB Tech Lab developed that allows the publisher or its CMP partner. Um, so that could be a CMP like catch that would access the privacy string that's been encoded and then allow it to be sent to each entity downstream in the ad supply chain that would need to read it and understand what those users' choices are. And again, if they're MSPA signatories, that means that they're also promising to limit how they use the information in accordance with the contract terms and with the user choices. There are also ways for uh, code that's running on the page to access those choices. So if you have uh, a company's pixel on your page to do analytics, ad measurement, or other functionality, um, there's also a way for them to access that privacy string on the page and adhere to it. Okay, and so again, quickly, what, what does it mean to sign up for the MSP, if you, MSPA if you want to participate in this framework? There is a registration portal you can visit, um, and we've provided links here. They're going to be in the slide deck for you to look at after the presentation. Um, and you can um, go to that portal, provide the information needed to register, and become a signatory. And by signing, what this does is it opens up a pathway for you to engage in covered transactions with other signatories that include all the privacy pr protective um, features of the agreement and all the compliance benefits that we just talked about. Um, first parties that sign, so if you're a publisher and advertiser and you sign the agreement, that means you have complete discretion as to when or whether to engage in covered transaction. Again, this is a pathway, not a requirement. You can say, I'm now able to engage in MSPA covered transactions and take advantage of that network when I want to. If you don't want to, maybe you have a direct deal with an advertiser and you have different terms you want to adhere to, no problem. You can still be an MSPA signatory. It's up to you to designate it as a covered transaction or not. Uh, downstream participants. So if you're an ad tech provider or someone else that supports an ad transaction, um, if you sign the MSPA, you're required to adhere to its terms only when the publisher says this one's covered. If, if they say this one's not covered and that's achieved through the signaling mechanism, then if you have a separate agreement with them, adhere to those terms. If you, if you don't have a separate agreement with them, you need to figure out your compliance obligations on your own. So again, this is just a pathway for compliance. It's not a 100% all the time framework. Uh, if you sign, you have a six month grace period to complete your GPP build to start sending and uh, processing the signals. And as I mentioned, we're gonna have a public signatory identification list so you can know who's participating in the framework. So I know that's a lot of information, um, but uh, hopefully that gives you a sense for how the industry is thinking about compliance with all these new state law requirements. And again, here's the resources. Uh, don't worry about these now. We'll send out the slides later so you can uh, review them. Hey, Tony. And with thanks. that, yeah. Thanks, Tony. That was awesome. So we're at the nexus of legal and technology. Elisa, you've, um, I hear you use this term in other forums, but this idea that it's contracts and controls, right? And Tony, you called it signals. I mean, this is the idea. We're in the, we're in the middle of that. I'm going to talk a little about how marketers and advertisers are responding to this and how their tech stacks are changing, but also introduce, you know, a third stakeholder, which is important to them, which is the consumer and how they think about it and how that is uh, kind of changing the way we process data. So firstly, the, the days of kind of the wild west of data collection are gone, right? The, the idea that you collect as much data as you can, store it for as long as you can. I mean, those days are gone. I think most people understand that now. The mission for most brands is to be responsible stewards of data. And for that, I mean, we, we talked about notice that collection and, and transparency, we could add to that, consumer control, kind of all these concepts are ideas now that in, in the data-driven economy, you build trust with consumers if you do that. And so we'll roll through some of how people are thinking about this and how they think about data privacy, how that's reshaping marketing. And we'll also talk about how marketing tech stacks are changing and talk through some of the use cases that you mentioned, Tony. So firstly, I mean, there's, it, it seems to be, there's a big chasm between where businesses are today and where customers are when it comes to data practices. And I think part of that challenge is that there's a ton of complexity in data privacy that we don't have to kind of get into, but, but obviously there's, there's a ton of regulations. They're constantly changing. You need to flex to do that. The IAB has been doing some really good work to help simplify that. But as we kind of, that, that, that concept you mentioned, Tony, of kind of having a, a consumer choice or a signal make its way through uh, a, a company's systems is a, is a complex enterprise. You know, on average, 
A company may have 30 or 40 data systems. So to reflect that choice across those data systems is no easy task. We talked about identity a little bit, digital identities across different devices and uh, connected TVs and whatnot. Consumer choice needs to be reflected across that. So it's a complex ecosystem we're working with. On the other side of that, what we're seeing is that consumers actually are, are, are demanding that companies treat their data more responsibly. We'll, we'll dig into what that is and how companies are responding. But firstly, we just we did a study, Catch did a study about three or four months ago on how people value their data privacy and what that means for marketers and brands. And some of the results were surprising. Firstly, and this is no secret, but US consumers highly value their data privacy. Three quarters of the, of, the, of the people that we surveyed said that we rate it from an eight to 10, hugely important to them. What was interesting is that when we asked the same question about sustainability and diversity and inclusion, those numbers were closer to 50%. Not that data privacy is more important than those issues, that wasn't the takeaway. It's, it had broader appeal. And the way marketers are kind of thinking about this is we're investing in sustainability. We're building the infrastructure to actually show that we're doing something about sustainability, right? Kind of reinvigorating supply chains and whatnot. We're out there talking about diversity and inclusion, but we're actually doing something about it by hiring diverse workforces. And back to your idea, uh, Elisa, about contracts and controls, when it comes to data privacy, I think it's a similar thing. You can't just be out there saying that we're transparent and we're doing all this stuff. You, you have to use frameworks like the IABs and other things to actually reflect that choice across your systems, right? It's not just about this, you know, what we like to say, the Hollywood facade of privacy, you need to back it up with something. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little. And so the investment that people are making in sustainability and diversity uh, the key takeaway for me here is that, and for most marketers, data privacy is up there as one of those values that we share with consumers and we need to build the infrastructure to kind of make that happen. What was interesting about it as well is, is, is it's important to consumers, uh, data privacy is, but they had huge concerns about how their data is being gathered and used. The concerns were twofold, mostly. It was about a lack of transparency, which we can solve when we provide notice at collection, and a lack of control. This idea that consumers can't, don't feel like they can make these choices about privacy and how their data is being used and have that be reflected across all of their systems. And we'll talk about how CMPs can help with that. And Tony, you talked about how the IAB signaling framework helps with that. That's, I think that's two key parts of, the, parts of that equation. Here's a part that I really loved about the study. Consumers are highly value their data privacy. They're concerned about how brands are treating their data, but they get it. And I think we, we haven't given consumers enough credit in that they understand there's a value exchange in sharing data with brands. They're not necessarily turning that off. They see the benefits. They see what's, what happens when you, when you treat their data well. And to summarize that a little bit, I mean, you know, it's kind of obvious, but there's discounts they get, there's personalized experiences, they're learning about new products. Consumers understand this at the super nuanced level. And so marketers are responding in kind. And we're starting to see that for brands that adopt responsible data practices, practices and we'll talk about what they are, they start to see a real benefit, an increase in trust with consumers, an increase in purchase intent. So it, it, it's a revenue driver now in a way that maybe people hadn't really thought about it before. When we talk about responsible data practices, we've, we've put it in these four buckets, there's more than these, but, but this idea that you collect the right and relevant amount of data for, for the purpose and for, for what you're actually trying to do, be that advertising, be that measurement, be that analytics. The level of transparency, this idea that you're transparent about what you're collecting, why you're collecting it, who you're sharing it with uh, was important. And then, and thirdly, the length of storage. So how long are you keeping that data for? Are you keeping it for an appropriate amount of time? And of course, are you, are you sharing data across entities with consumer permission? If you do all these things, consumers will reward brands. And so marketers are starting to get their head around this. And one of the, one of the big marketing KPIs is around purchase intent. What can I do to influence a consumer's decision? And what we start to see is that if you do data privacy right, if you have responsible data practices, that drives a 23% lift in purchase intent, which is huge. How that filters down to revenue depends on who you are as a company and what you're selling. Is it a fast moving good? Is it durable? Is it not? 
but 15 to 70 percent of that number could filter down to revenue so you know we're starting to see that you do this stuff right you could get a four percent lift in revenue as you do this and apple is a perfect example we're starting to see a shift from android to apple and you see how how privacy forward apple is we won't talk about if it's real or not but it's they're out there talking about privacy and i think and consumers are starting to reward that and brands and marketers are starting to follow uh, in their foot so how's it how's the tech stack changing i won't go through this eye chart but this is a typical typical modern marketing stack and one of the, the two key pieces of technology that are changing, that are being embedded in these marketing stacks are highlighted in red. I'll talk about them briefly. It's a consent management platform. It's not the old school cookie banner. I'll talk about the differences and it's a clean room. And, and Tony, some of those use cases you talked about when it comes to combining data, folks are doing that in a clean room. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but I also wanted to, to highlight, you know, the data is kind of the lifeblood of this marketing stack. And you see that on the left here, the different types of data. And the first party data is, is data brands collect on their own that a consumer has given them directly. Second party data is, is somebody else's first party. And that's, Tony, I think that's what people are sharing, right? When, when you're rolling with those measurement use cases, with those frequency capping use cases. And third party data, especially third party cookies, is the data that's going away as Google and others are deprecating cookies. So marketers are thinking about these tech stacks and what they're seeing is, I need to make these changes so that privacy is embedded. But the underlying theme is also that you know, I'm dealing with less data. The quantity of data that, I've net, that I used to use to run my business is starting to diminish. So I need to focus on how to get more and specifically how to get more first party data and how to get better quality data that could be through combinations of data. And that's where consent managers and clean rooms come in. So on the consent management side, a couple of key takeaways. It's not just about capturing consent or providing you know, only notice of collection. The idea is kind of combining Elise and Tony's presentations here. It's when you get that consent in, It needs to go somewhere, it needs to be reflected. We've seen too many times that, you know, people have consent data and it gets emailed around in spreadsheets and updated in different systems uh, across their businesses and businesses that they work with. The idea is that that needs to happen programmatically. So as you think about consent managers, don't just think about the who's capturing consent, but who's actually orchestrating it and pushing it through your system. And Pete Catch does that, if I can do a small plug there. It's It's... And to summarize what a next generation consent manager does, the front end data collection is the cookies and it goes beyond cookies. It gets to the idea of permissioned use and purpose that you talked about. It's if you, instead of having a banner say, well, what I'm actually collecting data for is analytics or targeted advertising. And then cookies may be in service of that you solve kind of two things. You, you solve the idea that you're now transparent with what you're actually doing, but also you have embedded now or appended to that data what its permitted use is. So you can start to start to uh, actually affect purpose limitation. And you do that across your system. So if you've collected data for a specific reason, be it analytics, be it targeted advertising, the idea is that you can make sure that that purpose makes its way through all the systems and all the users across your organization and in your ecosystem. We like to think of it as consent orchestration rather than capture. And so they're kind of three ideas to keep in mind as you think about consent managers. The other big piece of tech uh, that marketers are starting to use more is the clean room. So Tony, you talked about combining data. Out of 266 marketers surveyed, about 80% said, we're gonna to start to share data with businesses over the next 12 months for exactly the use cases you mentioned, Tony. This idea that someone who's looking to measure the returns on their ad spend doesn't have all the data they need to complete the customer journey. So they need to get it from somewhere. A classic example is a consumer goods manufacturer, who, like someone who sells cereal, and they are running hundreds of millions of dollars of advertising. But when somebody actually buys cereal, they buy it at a grocery store, and only the grocery store knows the purchase data. So the idea that you can link those and understand the effectiveness of your media is important. 
And folks are doing that combination through a clean room. And so privacy is one of the biggest challenges for data collaboration. So as marketers are thinking about clean rooms, they're thinking about clean rooms that have privacy embedded at the core, and it's, it's a hugely important issue. Some of the things you think about clean rooms, and another way to, to talk about them is, is to call them collaboration rooms, or I think that gets to the heart of what they do. When you're looking at clean rooms, some of the things to look for, no one wants to kind of replicate data and bring it back in, into a system. Data needs to stay distributed, stay where it is, and the controls for that data just kind of follow it. Clean rooms operate well beyond, uh, beyond data sharing, and we can talk at another time on kind of the role of consumer data platforms in this and, and how, how they're changing. But clean rooms can also activate data, and that's a way to add uh, a layer of value to data you've collected and collaborated on. And as you, as you build data sharing relationships, you start to add to the quality and quantity of the data that you have. So it helps you address, helps marketers address one of the key challenges they're facing, which is this kind of reduction in data availability. Um, so I wanted to leave you with those, those themes. Elisa, thanks for answering some of those questions that were coming through uh, in the chat there. Uh, Tony, Elisa, any, any closing comments or any other questions we can address? I think that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think, it, you know, look, there's, there are a lot of questions going forward and, and they don't all get addressed in the webinar, but I think kind of maintaining the dialogue, talking with peers, um, benchmarking. Uh, I thought, JJ, the, the statistics that you showed are really helpful because some of this is we got to bring the business along. Um, this is a, a huge cultural shift. It's an inflection point, And this is where legal and business really have to get come together. And when you can talk about like the positive side, not just the negative side of, of compliance here. I think that that's a, it's a big motivator. Thanks, Lucy. And I, I really flew through those uh, for the sake of time, but if anybody wants to, to chat about those or chat to Tony and Lisa and I about some of these legal issues uh, and some of the tech issues and responses, uh, happy to take that call. All right. Well, Tony, Lisa, I appreciate your time. You guys, are one of the you guys are the luminaries in the space. I appreciate you making the time and chatting through this with us all. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Tony and Alyssa. We uh, really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. We also want to give a big thank you to Catch for sponsoring today's webinar, so that it is free to our audience. You'll be able to find the recording as well as the link to download the slides in the My Purchases section of your My IAPP online profile. And lastly, I do want to encourage you to click the survey link that was just put in the chat. If you give us your feedback on today's program, it will help us to improve our future web conferences. Uh, that wraps up the program here today. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope to see you in another IPP web conference soon.